uh, today's Clara Cafe is looking at the end of Trump and the birth of hope, an alternative view of the state of the union. Um, so we've asked our speakers to consider things around how do we recover from this? Um, what does the future hold for American progressives? Um, and especially, you know, dealing with the far right that obviously still exists and is a reasonably uh, large proportion of the population voted that way. Um, what does the Biden presidency mean? Is it the birth of hope or is it, um, you know, possibly um, not that end? Or is he going to approach the, you know, huge issues that we need to um, look at, like the pandemic and the climate crisis? Um, so without further ado, I think if everybody can turn their cameras off, except for us, the three speakers. So uh, Larry, Rebecca and Paul, if you keep your cameras on, that would be great. Um, and I will hand over to Rebecca. So Rebecca um, serves on the board of directors of the Madison Mutual Aid Network and Human. Uh, the Global Mutual Aid Network. She serves as the president of the board of directors for the online publication Toward Freedom, Toward Freedom, uh, and is a founding member of the Wisconsin Media Cooperative. So welcome from the States, Rebecca, and if you'd like to start us off with your 10-minute presentation, that would be great. Thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm also um, a uh, three-term elected official in my city. I sit on my city's council and um, I come from the worker cooperative movement, being a worker owner at Union Cab, a taxi cooperative of about 200 members for the past 20 years. So taxi driver too, and also a water protector. Anyway, um, I'm also a grandma to baby Pearl who lives in Manchester, England. And I just, she was born um, on January 28th on the full moon. And it kills me that I can't be with her right now and that it'll be a while before I can hold her. Um, so I'm also uh, ancestrally from the village, a uh, number of miles right down the road from you, the village of Kemble. Uh, my ancestors were from there in, you know, in the 1600s, I think they traced their, um, there is when the first lot came over here. So I've had the pleasure of visiting there and it's a, it's, um, yeah. So anyway, I, thank you, Lynn um, and Bob, uh, Madison Expatriates for inviting me here. Um, I'm gonna talk about, I'm involved in local politics and I'm involved in local politics for a reason. And that's because our, our um, national and state level politics have been completely captured by industry and big big money and there is no way that organized people can uh, can have a have a voice at those levels of government in 2015 princeton university did this study that said you know literally that the u.s federal government is an oligarchy and that no matter how much lobbying organized people do um it 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 has very little effect uh, on policy so I wanna start from there and, and start talking about not just the last four years, but really the last 40 years, because the, the Trump era wasn't, it wasn't discontinuous from, from the politics of what had been happening before. It was, it was just sort of a, a, gross, um, a gross amplification of forces um, that have always been you know, in, in our culture, in our politics, in our, in our society. And, and it was a shock. Um, it was a shock to a lot of people, uh, to most of us really that, that we were able to elect him, but it was a shock to me in the eighties when we elected Ronald Reagan. Um, I really, I was like, how did this, who actually voted for this person? Like I, I didn't know people who had voted for Ronald Reagan. And so, you know, if we talk about going back to the 80s and even the 70s with the, the beginning of serious um, organization of the right wing in this country and serious um, uh, deregulation of every, pretty much every protection that had ever been built over, you know, over the 60s and the early 70s, um, the busting of unions, the um, removal of, of protections um, of the environment, the complete like 
entrance into a casino uh, finance, world of finance. Um, and the, in the part of the country I live in now, um, in Ho-Chunk territory in, in Madison, Wisconsin, um, you know, the deindustrialization uh, over the, again, over the last 40 years. And that led, has led to a lot of pain amongst the populace. That has led to a lot of resentment. Um, the Democrats did not, you know, uh, in, in the 90s, Bill Clinton's administration did, did more to deregulate the financial sector than any other president um, that, that has led to, you know, crisis after crisis. And, and we're, we're, we're coming up to another one. So I just want to um, point out that that yes, Trumpism, Trump and his administration was was awful, and they did things. Um, uh, they they did you know immigration policy and um, his style of his style of leadership that allowed people in our communities to express their hate and their disdain for each other in ways that we hadn't seen. And that caused a lot of harm. But if we're talking about, um, you know, with him being gone, things are all better now, they're not. Um, and I think, you know, we've seen Biden in his first 50 days go back on many of his campaign promises that had to do with systemic issues like around minimum wage and, um, you know, uh, protection for, children at the border, uh, reuniting families, etc. A lot of the things he promised have not, he has not delivered on. So why I'm in local politics, it's, it's the same reason why I'm uh, involved in mutual aid networks, why I'm involved in, you know, in water protection efforts, why I'm involved in worker cooperatives. It's because I believe that relationships uh, with our relationships with each other based on um, compassion and understanding the needs of the other is that this is what's going to help us create a new world. This is what is going to re really create a new world. And I extend that relationship, uh, you know, relationships not just to other people, but to the land and to the water and to, to all, all beings. Um, and, and I've learned so much from, from uh, Paul from my indigenous uh, friends up north and um, in, in, um, in the Midwest about how, about how having those relationships is really the basis for any hope at all. Um, so, so what I think is that around, you know, right, what, like right wingers in our, in our communities, um, we found out in a struggle against the largest open pit uh, iron mine that was that was proposed for the shores of Lake Superior, um, we found out that just going going and having fish fries uh, in, in communities and talking to people who might be who you know really are right wingers about water and babies that that's the thing that builds community and builds understanding and that one's you know, political party affiliation really pales in comparison to the care we have for each other in community. And um, if we can build um, understanding with each other on, on those common grounds, instead of just you know, calling each other names and yelling at each other, um, I think that's really where, where the hope for the future is. Um, in terms of local, what I'm trying to do in local government and city government, at which in, in our state, the city government elections are nonpartisan. So you don't have to be, uh, come from any party to stand for election. You can just be yourself. And parties sometimes get involved and in endorsing candidates, but you're not representing a party. So for me, I, I love being able to talk to everyone and talk about our shared concerns. And, and during this pandemic, the, um, the, the definition of those concerns is, is greater. And the effects of the underlying um, systemic inequalities, underlying systemic um, failures are just exacerbated. And it's actually a lot easier to talk to people and to, to build that common ground um, in, in tough times like these. And I think, you know, when we talk about 
tough times. It's like tough times, yes, with the pandemic, but also with the climate, also with, with the economy. And um, I find an extraordinary amount of hope in these openings we have. And I think that um, building relationships, building good local policies and local projects that are that can demonstrate that we can take care of each other we, with our collective resources, um, despite what you know the, the federal government wants to do to us or the state wants the state government, which in our state is you know horribly um, regressive, um, that, that we can find ways to take care of each other and, and share those ways with others and to, to, to um, you know, build a movement that can eventually take some power um, at these higher levels. So with that, I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Thanks, Rebecca. That was um, really uh, inspiring. And I think it's one of those things that, you know, um, like you say, when the national politics doesn't, you know, agree with you or you don't agree with it, you can take power back at a local level and that you can, you know, use action based politics to, to, to build those bridges and communities, whether it's, you know, finding common ground and sort of leaving party politics at the door. And like you say, I think that so many people are struggling through this pandemic and current times that um, there's a lot more common ground that we find ourselves having with people we might not have done before. Um, thank you very much for kicking us off. Okay, so hopefully Paul the man is still here. I can't see him on my screen. But, oh yeah, I can see you. Hi Paul. Um, Hello. So uh, <clears throat> welcome to the Cloud Cafe. Thanks for joining us. So um, I will just give a, a brief introduction. Uh, Paul is also known as Gabelis. Apologies if I uh, incorrectly pronounced that. Good. Okay, thank you. Um, who is a news journalist, um, is managing editor and CEO of the Indian Country Communications, uh, News from Indian Country, and the producer for Indian Country TV. Um, he's a member of the Oneida Nation of, okay, of Wisconsin um, with relations on many Ojibwe reservations in Wisconsin and Minnesota. Um, he's also a former Indian Affairs Policy Advisor under Governor Anthony S. Taylor. Okay, uh, welcome and uh, please feel free to start your presentation. Yeah, me miigwech for doing that. Thank you. Buju and Dinoi Magan Duk, Skabewa Sinujini Kaz. I want to say hello to all my relatives, uh, wherever you might be sitting on the earth today. Uh, my Ojibwe name is Skabewis. I'm also known as Paul uh, Demain, and uh, Skabewis is kind of like a messenger. So lots of, uh, lots of capability to speak, speak in long phrases. So I won't disagree with any of the perspectives that Rebecca gave. She uh, has a viewpoint uh, as an activist that we've seen uh, across continents in many cases and her election in the Madison City Council is something that uh, inspires both me and many, many other people and certainly women across the state, even though Dane County and Madison where she lives is, is a, such a progressive bastion, we expect no other. Uh, it's just that this stuff uh, spreads with time and example. So um, you're talking about a little bit about all kinds of things here today, um, but I want to let you know that I came in from outside where uh, it's just starting to rain and sleet and all kinds of things in northern Wisconsin, uh, helping set up a sugar bush operation here where we're going to uh, tap our trees uh, different kinds of trees and make maple syrup and maple actually sugar because uh, we take it right down to sugar for storage purposes and uh, be looking for the birch uh, sap and the medicines and some of the other trees that we also tap and all those things that the creation has given us as uh, people on this earth. So we're out harvesting, we're, we're already gathering medicines. We've held a, uh, a ceremonial here last Friday night for the first time in over a year because of the pandemic. So we're coming together, but 
what happened during uh, this pandemic, I think, is like a portal into a new world. There is there is no uh, no event like the Spanish flu or any of these other plagues that have taken place in a historical context that hasn't dramatically changed society in one way or another. And so uh, there's many of us in the indigenous environmental political community that really believe that uh, this is a portal to change. And uh, Rebecca talked about hope and I see hope uh, everywhere, not only in the emotional feeling of being able to go back out and hug my grandchildren for the first time in many, many months, but to be able to embrace uh, the people who are on the front lines of activism in our communities as corporate America just kind of does its thing during the pandemic any way it's want, just like some of our legislators who decided they were just gonna march straight ahead and make sure that the stock market does well and people make good money during the pandemic any way they can while uh, claiming that certain things are hoaxes like the pandemic itself or global warming in the face of all the evidence that says, you know, something's going on here, people. If you can't see it, uh, you're not breathing, you're not, you're not using your eyeballs, you're not hearing what's going on uh, around us because the evidence is there and it's very broad. So we have opportunities, <clears throat> the opportunities uh, not only to change the focus of fossil fuel industries because we saw uh, what a reduced fossil fuel society is from space looking down on earth in many places that clean themselves, uh, many places that were treated more kindly than ever before because of the lack of human waste and destruction being thrown all over the place. And uh, we think we saw an opening door in the beginning of the end of the, uh, the, the fossil fuel industry starting, you know, I'm not in favor of shutting down all oil today. I'm in favor of getting rid of tar sands, the dirtiest of all uh, mineral extractions that exist in the world and uh, stopping that from flowing through the United States on a shortcut that earns a, or that earns a foreign corporation huge dividends for, you know, and millions for its corporate owners why it destroys everything in its way in Northern Minnesota as they put another, what might be the last FOSS tar sands fossil fuel oil pipeline uh, in the history uh, of the industry. Uh, as it does its thing, uh, we try to, uh, try to figure out uh, how to work the system. And it's not just uh, progressives versus the right as kind of was put up before, it's really progressives versus the, uh, the, the, the center right in the Democratic Party or even the center of the Democratic Party in many cases. And those interests that are corrupted by uh, huge amounts of money coming into the political party for lobbying, cons lobbying considerations. I mean, one of the biggest lobbyists uh, for uh, Enbridge in the state of Wisconsin is run by a little clique of uh, Democratic uh, partisans who uh, have access to the Democratic National Committee as delegates and, and, and politicians and things have happened uh, by sleight of hand out of the mind of not only just everybody, but the indigenous communities and those resources that are still reserved and utilized in Northern Wisconsin under treaties with the United States. So when we talk about a change, and I worked in state government for four years and uh, Rebecca's in, you know, on a city council where I think you can get more local things done uh, at times than you can in the atmosphere of the upper level uh, political arena. Uh, it's a lot easier to throw rocks at the political system from the outside than to be on the inside like I was and see the rocks coming from your own community at times because you can't uh, facilitate uh, structural change as as fast as society deserves. Uh, but, but certainly uh, with people throwing hurdles uh, in front of you at every chance they get because uh, they they uh, they think you're you're the enemy, and and so you get things done at times. Uh, I don't hold. I just say it all right. I don't you know I don't hold high hopes for the Biden administration in a lot of ways because the the flip flop is 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 not to the to the to the far left or the far right on a lot of these things over there. Even though I think Trump almost tipped the whole darn thing over. 
uh, it's usually that battle in the middle. And you see that in some of the political arena that's going on where uh, the Democrats are in control, but there's even conservative Democratic center senators who are saying they don't believe in getting rid of the filibuster, which allows uh, a minority to uh, stop legislation of all kinds. And so uh, there's a lot of hurdles to overcome, but I see some incremental good things. Uh, not that I wouldn't mind if Texas seceded from the United States and started its own little ultra conservative thing down there. Uh, and they can build walls on both sides of the border, I guess, if they want. And people can just float around or build ladders and climb over. But um, the, the, the question uh, of, of what we're to do is, is to not go out to kill the enemy and not to create an enemy that wants to kill us, but to find a way to bring some of these people back into a little bit better balance with uh, where they're going. And so we want, you know, I, I see hope in that. I have uh, phone numbers for the first time in four years to the White House to talk to people. And I haven't pestered those phone calls because I know there's a lot on the table and desks of those individuals that I could call up and say, hey, stop line three. Well, we, we already know that, but we have to uh, be uh, calculative and we have to work with the policy within the Biden administration and the president and all the powers that push back and forth from many, many different directions. But I have hope that in those meetings, that when the, when, when the president is teetering on someone, some, some indigenous representative, which we have, we have a member of the Bad River Ojibwe tribe in the White House now, who might just be delivering you know, some coffee would say, hey, that's a good idea, you ought to do it. And, it. and it moves the paradigm over one little notch to get something done. I see great hope in Deb Halen being uh, appointed to the Department of Interior in a way, uh, the first time where we may have someone who is going to look out for treaty resources and monuments and ancient history that goes back thousands of years in this country before the coming of the white man. Uh, that took place and, and, and we feel that th there's a lot of positive value in maintaining those places and not having oil drills and mining companies come in and see uh, only dollars of board feet when they see a forest rather than seeing a diversified forest that gives us lodging and gives us medicine and gives us food on a regular base basis and can be ma managed on a sustainable level for to the help of the climate and and the retention of uh, carbon carbon and all these other things that it does rather than someone standing there and saying oh that's a beautiful forest i wonder what the board feed is worth if we cut it all down and and knock it off and it it's and it, and it dies off for 40 or 50 years we have to change the paradigm of how people think about society in regards to uh, a society that uh looks at the merit and principle and ethic of you know, giving more away than what you hoard and accumulate and think you need versus want. And so I hope the initiatives that I see coming out of this administration and USDA policy has to do with self-sustainability at the local level. Uh, Walmart has, you know, and Sam Walton, God bless his rich heart, uh, has put a lot of local people out of business in our communities. And I think the pandemic uh, and uh, other things that are going on, you know, I mean, look at the energy grid in Texas that failed rather than everyone having a solar panel on the roof that might get them through a sunny, sunny uh, winter day when it's way below freezing. And uh, let's look at the, the failure of the big national international transportation systems during the pandemic, where in the United States, you couldn't find toilet paper because everyone was dependent on Sam Walton's delivery chain into northern Wisconsin. You know, what, what happened? You know, I, I don't know if we can go back to Moss again, but I think we ought to look at how uh, regional and local distribution chains uh, uh, provide jobs and opportunities at the local level in a sustainable uh, activity that uh, doesn't just uh, cut down uh, old growth forest in, in uh, Brazil and other places. So I got a lot of high hope. And uh, I think, I don't know if I've used 10 minutes up, but uh, I, uh, I think there's been some real nice battles uh, already won. Uh, the Keystone XL uh, pipeline crossing permit from Canada and the United States was revoked by the Biden administration. I think that uh, in court cases, 
if allowed to argue our cases now in federal court on line three pipeline extension in Minnesota, that we will have a favorable ruling because we don't have a Trump administration that wants to jobs, 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 uh, permits uh, for, uh, I mean, we, we, we took some giant steps back on environmental protections in the last four years. And what I hope to see is not only a restoration, but a step forward in further protections and uh, an administration that provides resources for a just transition. So all the pipeline workers in Northern Minnesota who are worried about jobs, jobs, jobs can convert to green energy and uh, we can continue to sit down in front of their projects and slow it down. So we extend their contracts from 60 days to 120 days worth of salaries and wages and food on the table for their families. And they're just happy with water protectors everywhere. So that's kind of my agenda uh, and kind of a rough overview of what I can, uh, I think about. And, and uh, you know, let's, I'll wait for some questions a little bit later. I'll hand it off. Miigwech. Thank you so much. That was a, a really fantastic summary and um, some really interesting points that you've made, especially right at the end there around, you know, more localized food networks and stopping it so that we're buying uh, food from all over. We've actually had a cloud cafe uh, not too long ago on how we can do it more locally in Stroud uh, and support our local farmers and, and bring things into the local economy. So really, I think, you know, your points around the pandemic is a catalyst for change. Um, and the opportunity that we've got now to not only um, fix what was broken within the Trump administration, but also to, you know, build back better is, is a really interesting concept. So thank you so much for that um, overview there. Okay, so last but definitely not least, um, we have Larry Sanders, who is an American British academic, um, a social worker, politician, and health spokesperson for uh, the Green Party of England and Wales. Um, Larry immigrated to the United Kingdom in 19. And became a lecturer at the University of the West of London and later Oxford in the Department of Social Administration. Um, and uh, he has a very famous older brother with a very nice pair of gloves, which I'm sure he's wearing this winter, um, Bernie Sanders. But here we are. Thank you very much, Larry, for joining us. And uh, your 10 minutes can start now. Thanks. Hi. Well, it's a real pleasure. It's a special pleasure to hear from Re Rebecca Scalpius. Um, it, it's a funny business being a, a person of two nationalities, uh, both of which I don't particularly, <laughs> their governments have been doing terrible things for a very long time. Um, but it, there is an American optimism in the midst of disaster, which I love, and which I think I might have lost, but I'll try to get, try to get it back. Um, yes, th th there's so many resonances. Uh, I want to start with the with where, with what we've just barely avoided um, that narrow victory over Trump. I mean, everybody here who follows politics knows just how narrow it was. Not in the total votes, but in terms of a electoral college, uh, a few thousand votes in a few states made the difference. And what I think of when I think of Trump winning again a re-election, you think of that horrible day when he took his Bible, or somebody's Bible, uh, cleared the streets of, of, of peaceful protesters, walked up to a church. I mean, it's between hilarious and disgusting, uh, and carried with him, or brought with him, the leader, the, the civilian leader of the, of the armed forces, the Secretary of Defense, and the military leader, the chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, now, happily, but barely, I think, both of those people said uh, that they were, they'd made a mistake going along with him. That he was not, as had been the tradition in America with all its flaws, the military has not been in direct control of military leadership, has not been in direct control of military personnel, except for a couple of exceptions. I, I, don't want to get too complicated because everything has exceptions. Uh, but in a long history, it's pretty much civilian control. And we were tipping over. And what you notice, of, though, of course, is that after the election, even after he'd lost, he fired the Secretary of Defense and replaced him with a crony, with somebody who would do his bidding. If he had won, the, chief, the, the chiefs of staff would have been changed, I'm sure. 
and replaced. We would have had a man like Trump in direct control, I think, of the military of the United States. And I, I don't want to think about what that would have meant because there would have been resistance and there would have been so, something like a civil war and, 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 and a lot of bloodshed. So we, we buy, I think, we, I think we're required to do a lot now that we have having avoided that in a way we, to, to take some kind of courage from the fact that we avoided that, that disaster and we can go somewhere else. Um, so that, that's one, one big part that's in my mind all the time when we talk about hope uh, and disaster. Now, the other, another kind of strand is, I think Rebecca mentioned it, we've had 40 years of a very specific transfer of wealth and income from the bulk of the population to the very rich. It's, the statistics are completely clear. And then they're the national, the government statistics, they're not anybody's guesses, guesswork. Um, and that's had an immense impact. And underneath the impact of the transfer of wealth and all the suffering amongst the people from whom that wealth has been taken, we have understandings built up. And the greatest understanding and the great disaster of Reagan uh, was the idea that governments are a problem. Governments, they can't really do anything. If they do anything, it'll be a problem, it'll be bad. And I may differ a bit I, I, f with Rebecca and Scribuis. I do see government as just absolutely essential. I, I resonate to the, all the things that people can, that we can do for each other and that we do do with and for each other. But we cannot have a decent society unless we have a powerful and effective and government, but a government that is obviously is working for the for the bulk of the people, uh, and that's that's. So I take hope. I. It's not always easy for me to say nice things about uh, Joe Biden, <laughs> because I, I, as you might have guessed, was hoping for a different uh, person on inauguration day. But the wherever it's come from, just for even this first act that was passed and it doesn't have the, uh, the, the minimum wage, the living wage, um, and, it's, and, it, and it hasn't got the uh, Medicare for all. Uh, but nonetheless, the, in the next few months, hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars will go to people who need it. And that, I think of the money going to parents with children, uh, what, what's it going to be, 300? Uh, dollars a month for some and, th and 350 for younger children, something like that, which is about for people for, in the UK, that's something like double what we're getting from our long established but but quite weakened uh, child benefit, which, which kept um, me and my family afloat uh, when the children were small. Um, so the, I think, 69 million people are going to get that money. A lot of tens of millions are going to get this $1,400 check instead of 2,000. But for the first time in a very long time, people are going to see the direct real result of government that works for them. And I'm just hopeful that that's going to make a tremendous difference across the board. People will call them conservatives and so on. We've got such, so much crazy um, uh, theories. Now the, the crucial bit for, for Britain, one crucial bit anyhow, for Britain and for the United States has, I think we have to take the uh, understanding that's come from this recent economics. The United States is going to have, I think 22 trillion pound dollar um, deficit, debt, not deficit, debt. The UK has spent, has, has created, the government created, I think 400 uh, billion pounds in the last year. Um, and it claims that it's had a deficit, but it hasn't had a deficit because it created the money that it's calling a deficit. I don't know if enough people understand what that means. What it means is that the absolute connection between spending vast amounts of money and having large deficits and debts 
which is supposed to lead to disaster, you have to just have a look at what's happened and say, oh, by the way, this is vastly more than anybody. We, we were talking about 20 or 30 billion pounds to, to salvage our national health service. Uh, here they've got in one year, 400 billion. Uh, of course, a lot of it is wasted. It's ended up in the hands of very rich people who didn't need it at all. So it's not a, it's not that the money itself has gone in the right direction, although the American money does look like it's going to go mainly in the right direction. But if, if we can use this evidence to convince people that the money that the government produces is the money that belongs to the people of the country, that we, it's not an exception, it's not some crazy thing, spending the money is what governments are for. Creating the money is what governments are for. And I I sometimes think, well, there are three groups of people. My, my grandmother, I had a grandmother who had profound things to say about how many, what is this group versus that group. Anyhow, there are three groups of people. One who basically agrees with me, that the whole point of a government and an organized society is to make life decent provide for the possibility of a decent life for everyone. Okay, there's a lot of, lot of us. The second group of people says, no, that would be great, but we can't do it. There's reasons, there's not enough money, there's the rich people would take, would run away and, and so on. And the third group of reasons I've never quite understood, think that would be a terrible idea. Somehow it would really wound them deeply if everybody had a decent chance of that life. The, that middle group, if that middle group is won over to us, to, we've got it for a very long time, for generations. In fact, that's one of the reasons why the whole, why the uh, minimum wage is also so important. If people, in addition to having money in their pockets that they didn't have last month, that makes life better. If they also, everybody had a chance at a, 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 a moderately decent, fifteen dollars an hour is not a great income, but something. Uh, and the impact on the whole economy that uh, have people having more money in their pockets would, would have. Um, the minimum wage plus, plus the other things that have started, plus uh, the infrastructure that's being talked about, hundreds of billions uh, of useful things, into useful things with decent paying jobs and so on. Uh, well, the, I think that middle group is winnable. I think we might be on the verge of an more enormous success. Out of, out of the terror that we came so close to, out of decades of, of, of bad government, out of centuries of desperate racism, murder, the rest of it, out of the destruction of so much of Native America, out of all of that, we might just for no, no good good uh, things about us beyond the verge of of a, of a different society a society in which the debates are how what's the best way to use all our resources how do we best work together to do the things that we need to do um so i'm i'm somewhere between uh, uh, despair and hope um that's that, that's that'll do for a start Thanks, Larry. I think um, somewhere between hope and despair describes uh, the most of the world right now. So uh, thank you for your presentation and for um, taking us through that. I think, um, you know, through all of the three presentations that we've had, uh, there have been some key themes around um, building back better, uh, local action, that there is a place for government, but they need to be held accountable. Where is the money going and making sure that it's going to the best places possible? Um, and also um, not just to the people, but also to make sure that we protect the land um, and the water that is so important. Um, so uh, speaking of profound things that grandmothers say, I'll invite Molly Scott Cato to uh, be our first question. Molly, if you'd like to unmute yourself. You're very kind, Jenny, and you're <laughs> reminding everybody that I'm a very new grandmother, but uh, a very excited new grandmother. Um, so 
uh, I first wanted to say that I watched that video of Deb Harlan making her acceptance speech so many times and I've shared it with my friends and we're all in tears and we think she's just wonderful and the speech was just three minutes of perfection um, and I also very much enjoyed your um, connection with Kemble which is hilarious because it's honestly eight miles down the road and it does remind us doesn't it of the connections that we have and I'm speaking as somebody who's had a lifelong prejudice against the United States of America, which I've seen as the great imperialist, which has really actually been a kind of bad thing for me. And over the past year of lockdown, I've learned a lot more and read a lot more and actually overcome my prejudice. And it's been, you know, a very liberating and great time for me. So I was delighted to hear all of you and what you had to say. But um, yeah, and the thing I've come to understand is that the US invented representative democracy, kind of in opposition to us, and yet I didn't hear anybody that spoke kind of with any enthusiasm about representative democracy. So it feels like at the national level anyway, it feels like it's really run into the sand. And obviously that's true here, um, probably for different reasons, but related reasons. But I, so I want to ask really, I'm not giving up on national democracy, but what can we do to make it work for us? When we cast a vote in national elections here, my vote, you know, I voted for myself last time, but you know, um, it's not an effective vote uh, because of our system. And I think in the US, a lot of people that voted for Trump were decent people. They didn't want Trump. They voted Republican, right? Because they've got a choice. Shit or shitter, that's how I think of it here. It's probably the same there. You know, what, what can we do about that? Uh, we can't just give up on the amazing experiment that democracy is, but, but what can we do to sort of, in both our countries, um, save and make democracy effective. Thanks, Molly. So, okay, Rebecca's unmuted. If you'd like to come in first, Rebecca. I'm happy to address that. Thanks, Molly. Um, yeah, I, I actually agree with Larry that I believe that, no, we need a strong uh, government to do good things for people. And that's why I'm in city government um, to, to actually bring the argument that, um, you know, we, we even though private property is rampant in this country, we still, live on the commons. We still have common um, land, common water, common air we breathe, common interests, and we have a common treasury in our different levels of governments. We have common treasury. And it's really important for people to have a voice in saying how, you know, what are we gonna create with these commons? How are we gonna care for each other and, and protect each other with our common resources? So, um, you know, I, I am kind of negative about having uh, an influence, uh, organized people having an influence in, in, in federal government um, just because of the levels of money in politics. The Citizens United decision in 20, January 2010 that just blew the lid off of um, corruption, uh, off of like limitless corruption, basically. Um, so the question in my mind isn't do we give up on, on federal government? I was, I and my whole family were just, you know, since, since 2014, well, even before then, because my family lived in New England, they were big Bernie fans, but, you know, we really, like, I don't think the election results would have been as slim as they were uh, Biden versus Trump as they would have been Bernie versus Trump. The, in 2016, I was working as a journalist um, covering the Democratic National Convention in Philadelphia that year, and it was just, it was bone chilling to see how the Democratic, um, the DNC, what the, the lengths they were willing to go to stifle the voices of um, Bernie supporters. And what, what I witnessed myself standing outside the convention was that night of the nomination when three states delegations got up and walked out. Um, it was, I think it was like Washington, Oregon, and Wisconsin, uh, a lot of Wisconsin, those delegates were held at gunpoint in the press tent, um, told they couldn't leave because there were 10,000 people on the street, including uh, Jill Stein and Ajamu Baraka, the Green Party candidates, just waiting to embrace, you know, the sort of refugees from the DNC. But the, the police and militarized presence there to just to, to quiet, to, to stop the people's movement was just something like I've, I've seen a lot in my life, but it was something about that snipers, you know, pointing at these delegates uh, that was really just bone chilling to me. 
So I, I'm just, I'm so glad that Bernie came back to fight another day. Um, he got, you know, the DNC has a lot of dirty tricks that they play. Um, they spent more, more energy in the 2016 election fighting Bernie than they did fighting Trump. More, a, a lot more energy in the press, a lot more energy. Um, I haven't done, seen the actual breakdown of money, but definitely I've seen media analysis that, that shows that the, uh, the DNC and the Hillary campaign got a lot more, um, got a lot more press against Bernie than, than they did Trump. So I think, um, you know, we wouldn't be in this, the position that in this, you know, very, we wouldn't have been almost tipped over to the right had act real democracy been able to work without the influence of um, money and these these relationships of of, of power, of um, I guess that's that's as far as I'll go on that. But I still think the um, the the solution is for us to bring that aware to help people understand because people don't understand people don't understand how that works. People don't understand how how you know if if we do build a movement um that we can eventually overcome that but the movement has to be so much stronger than the money and the forces arrayed against it and that is our only that really is our only hope is building a movement around our shared values and our shared priorities and our shared uh humanity um around this thanks rebecca uh give you so larry would you like to come uh back on that as well Okay, if not, we can. I'm, I'm muted. I'm unmuted. Oh, um, sorry. <laughs> well, I share you. Know, I share some of Molly's. Um, uh, I don't know if it's pessimism. We are we are up against a difficult, very difficult situation. Uh, I've also been uh, a county county local uh, official, elected to to two four year terms in Oxfordshire as a member of the Green Party. Uh, I had. Been in the in the Labour Party in in the eighties and nineties and, and left them uh, because of, I thought they were hopeless and they are hopeless. It's a very sad thing for the UK. Uh, the Labour Party is traditionally split, uh, and but the uh, the right wing is always the better and organised. I think the a lot of the leftists get their pleasure as people like me do of spouting. And a lot of right wing people get their pleasure about organizing. I don't know how to put it better than that. Uh, and of course, they're, they're also helped by money. Uh, British politics are also heavily dominated by money. The sad thing is, it's very little bits of money. You can get a, a, a political party in Britain for a, a tiny fraction of what it costs you to get one in America. Uh, but it's just as effective. Uh, the current administration is the most corrupted, certainly in the 50 years that I've been living here. There is hardly a day in which you don't hear about a contract being given. And you find out it was given to somebody, to a corporation that had, a, you know, a share value of three, three pounds 50. Uh, it was, his address was a telephone box and uh, whose experience in the field uh, of medicine or whatever was about a week and a half old. And they and somebody gave them 350 million pounds and and then surprisingly they failed at whatever they were supposed to do and it goes on and on I, I, and of course behind all that is is the and and i don't know how this is our dilemma is is the media is rupert murdoch has has decided more elections in britain than than any tens of millions of, of voters you could, he's won every election, I don't know, for 30, 40 years. Uh, his, his newspapers have supported the winner. Um, and the policies, both personal to, to, to enhance his wealth and to represent his uh, policies, which are far right wing policies. How we get around that, I don't know. But, but I have to say that somehow or other, my little brother, came up on a stage and you know you, you look back at 2015 he, when he announces his uh, candidacy walked out of, out of the Senate he talked for about 10 minutes and he said now I've got to go back to work 
And two or three months later, he was standing on stages with tens and tens of thousands of people cheering him to the rafters. And all he had done is he'd come out and said, look, you need free education. Everybody, have, let's have it. We need, everybody needs health care. Why not have it? And people say, oh, well, yeah. So you had decades of, of this un unanimous, virtually unanimous press and, and media and all the rest of it. And they, and they said, okay, let's, let's go for it. Now, the, the opposition didn't go away. The money didn't go away. The media didn't go away. So we're in the middle of, of a battle. But I think that we have a better chance. We may lose. I mean, the Trumps will be back. This is not, you know, this is real stuff. But I, I, I'll use my age for the first time in public discourse. I will tell you that in my long life now, I have not seen a moment, well, since I was a child, perhaps under, under Roosevelt, and then that was being clouded by Hitler doing other things, uh, a time when I think that there is an opportunity. It is not a certainty. And it's people like Molly, it's like people like Rebecca and Scubuis and the people watching this thing, I don't, you know, speakers shouldn't compliment their audience. It's a cheap way of getting applause. We can't even get applause here. Uh, but I, it's not over and we're in it. And I think given the fact that the, we've had this breakthrough in, in towards destroying this economic fallacy that we've labored under, I think, I think we can do it. Thanks, Larry. Um, Skibius, did you want to come in on that or I can go to another question and come to you f first or if you'd like to just comment. I think you're unmuted now. Oh, oh you're muted again. Did you call on someone? Was it you? I think it was you. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I have a number of responses. I was looking at some of the chat stuff and uh, um, I, I just want to remind people that when you look at history, uh, every uh, issue that seems to be an issue of social justice and human rights tends to prevail in the end. So either it's the elimination of slavery in the United States or the establishment of uh, Indian voting rights in 1924 or women's voting rights or the civil rights movement or the movement to protect gay and lesbians in our country. <clears throat> Those battles all took time, but all prevailed in the end. So I think that gives me some high hope that uh, we, we can still uh, scratch and crawl our way to victory on a lot of these things. Um, someone had asked about voting and, and I simply can say sim just because I've been active since I was a kid with stuffing envelopes at my mother's feet while she was doing other political work is that I have always encouraged people to vote despite despair. I mean, I think we got something like 35% of the country that still does not participate in the voting process in the United States at all. And most of those are very, very poor people, disabled people, communities of color, and other communities that are already out, out of sight and out of mind. And, and a lot of these people just don't uh, believe uh, that they can have an impact or don't have the time uh, to be involved. And so um, I, I always say that we need, to, we need to vote. I mean, we won this last national political level uh, 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 election. And uh, I, I think this country was saved by uh, another four year disaster. I just don't know where this administration would have gone. So we have a victory there. We have a victory in the appointments to new people to EPA and Department of Interior and other places where we know that those environmental protections are gonna increase. Uh, we have a popular support for the stimulus bill, despite the fact that I don't see a whole horde of Republicans on the right side uh, returning their checks as being socialistically oriented redistrib redistribution of, of taxpayers' monies. You know, I don't even know if any of them on that side of the aisle have returned their checks saying we don't, we don't believe in redistributive policies. 
uh, to help the community. So you, you and, and, and indeed the stimulus bill itself may, may provide uh, that, uh, that reality approach that says government is needed and government can be affected. So we'll see where that goes. Uh, I want to talk about democracy. So, so I encourage voting from the top and the bottom and start at the local level because really at the local level, there are a lot of things you can get done. And as you move up, it's, it's more difficult and deliberative and give and take, but uh, big things do eventually happen. And uh, there is balance brought back into the system from, from what I can see. The thing is, is that I want to remind people that democracy as we know it today is in, in its infancy. You know, the Iroquois Confederacy was a couple thousand years old and the United States government is a little over 200. And even the capitalistic economic system that overlays uh, the democracy or, or whatever you want to call it, the Republican or, or however you describe our political system here, is that both of those systems in their current form are really untested in a lot of ways. And uh, 200, 200 years is, is a, a tiny little uh, fraction of, uh, of experience. And, and we see the rise and fall of empires and economies uh, all over the world and all over history. And I suspect that we're destined to do the same thing. I would, uh, Anishinaabe people have prophecies that there's been a flood three other times because human beings screwed up. And when you, when you talk about the prophecies in the lodge, and we look at what's going on with global warming today and the impact of the environment, most Anishinaabe people say it, it's been told, it's been foretold uh, what happens when you, uh, when you mess up your environment and disregard uh, what's happening around you. So uh, yeah, there's gonna be a lot of changes and there's gonna be a lot of failures. I hope, uh, I hope that someone realizes that uh, the capitalistic economic system seems like a good game of monopoly and someday, you know, Saros or, or someone else is gonna end up with everything and, and nobody, there won't be anything left on the board uh, if we continue to see the accumulation of wealth at the top without some redistributive policies uh, that, um, benefit the common man versus the corporations. And that's what I see in this administration. I see an administration that at least says it's interested in children and families and women and communities of color and environmental concerns and so forth. And I hope that it can bend the needle in our direction on all those fronts. So we already have had some successes for, so people who have voted to put this individual in office, uh, there's been some positive things. Not everything is for naught, even though uh, every single day I can point out something that I don't agree with, something I didn't get, something our people didn't get that I'm disappointed about, but uh, we're gonna move forward. And so there's an opportunity for reform. I, I hope to see a re reforming uh, of the electoral college, uh, of the filibuster, uh, of uh, how uh, the Senate, I mean, you know, California has two senators in Utah that has 10% of the population has two senators. So there is no uh, representative uh, one man, one vote when it comes to how the Senate operates. So there's a lot of flaws in our system from top to bottom. So the minute someone can figure out how to fix them all, let me know, because I'm, I'm interested in all kinds of <laughs> angles to that. So uh, lots of uh, Lots of things to fix and lots of things to reform, but I really do believe, I, I really believe that what Rebecca's done in terms of running locally is a place where we can have a huge uh, impact uh, and set a good example. It's so much easier to move things at that local, uh, smaller level of government there. You, you just sometimes do things. Uh, that's why I'm involved with some organizations, same thing. We, I, I don't care what government's doing. We're, just, we're gonna do things. We're gonna set up self-sustaining food systems and convert to the green energy uh, uh, era, whether people like it or not, we'll try to drag you along. Absolutely. Okay. Probably don't to, I probably don't have to drag anyone here along, but <laughs> we're gonna drag some people along. Yeah, I think a lot of people here are also trying to do exactly the same kind of thing uh, at a local level. So um, we absolutely know the struggle, but also, um, know that there are a lot of sort of quick and uh, quick wins that can happen locally. Okay, so I'm going to invite uh, Elizabeth to ask her question. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for the speakers. Uh, great, great talks. I really enjoyed it. Um, 
I was just wondering, I mean, one of the things that we took away from the Trump administration was his manipulation of the media um, and to what good effect he used it. Um, is there an opportunity for the Biden administration to use the media in a, in a similar way, but <laughs> much more of a force for good than Trump did? Um, he obviously created such a negative environment around America and, um, uh, uh, you know, and that and, and got a lot of power from the media as well. Thanks, Elizabeth. Do you want to kick us off, Larry? Oh, gosh. <laughs> oh, yeah, I just saw you're unmuted already, so. <laughs> uh, well, I, 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 I don't really know the answer, of course. Um, I, I suppose what, what I watch when I'm watching America is I'm, I'm trying to watch it or getting to watch it through Bernard's eyes. And I think his capacity to break through, even though he didn't eventually succeed, he broke through to tens of millions of people. And uh, I, I don't know how he did it exactly. It, it was partly obviously the policies, partly because he's transparently honest uh, and decent which is not all that usual in, in politicians. Uh, I hope Biden, I don't think Biden has, I don't know, charisma is a misused kind of word, but he certainly doesn't have it. Um, if he, I think uh, you know, Americans can take a lot of credit because Biden's policies now are not what Biden's policies were five, 10 or 20 years ago, or whatever, it was 112 years he was in the Senate. And, and he changed his policies. Uh, and he changed them because of the political organization of millions of people. Um, now, we haven't been as successful in, in Britain. Uh, we've got a particularly bad government. We have a particularly feeble opposition in the Labour Party. The Green Party is pretty good. I mean, it, I'm speaking among friends. Uh, I wish we were better. I wish we were more effective. Uh, the, the, the electoral system, of course, is a huge problem. And, but I noticed that more and more labor part, local labor parties are coming out in favor of uh, proportional representation. Now that would be a game changer. I, I mean, Mali would be in parliament. Even I would be in Parliament if we had had the first past the post, somebody told me. If we hadn't had first past the post. Um, so we would be in a, we would be a very, I mean, if one MP or one MP is so powerfully effective, uh, a few dozen of us would make, would make a, a, another difference. And I think we've got those people. But uh, at the, I have to admit personally to being somewhat uh, despondent at the moment on them on the British side of things. On the other hand, uh, they're going to make, they're making a huge mess. The, the incompetence as well as the corruption of the government has, is breaking through, I think. So maybe that's, that's where opportunity will come from. And there are loads and loads of people. I mean, a lot of the organizations that I work in, in terms of health and social care, the bulk of the activists are all Labour Party members. They're, they're likely represented by a useless uh, member of parliament, or oh, not by no means always, um, and uh, a party that, that daren't speak its mind. Um, but they're there, and they are they are friends of ours. Um, and so, although I'm slightly down at the, on it at the moment, I, I we had, we don't have a choice. We're not going to have an armed revolution. Uh, so our only choice is to win elections. Thanks, Larry. Uh, so, thanks, Rebecca. On the question um, of the media and Biden's use of it, I think, you know, we're in a, a climate of like highly, highly consolidated media. And um, one thing that Trump's uh, manipulation of the media brought out, I think, was an under understanding of that and his he was able to manipulate the media because they were so easy to manipulate um, because they are so predictable 
in what they cover, how they cover it. And he is a TV reality show star. So he, you know, he's all about, you know, show business and he, he knew how to play it. Um, so I think, you know, Joe, <laughs> Joe Biden and his administration are not that skilled in, um, in, I would say media relations. And I think, but what I think is good about Trump's um, contentious relationship with the media is that people, people are finally starting to wake up and understand that they really need to question all media. They need to question every single um, uh, mass media that comes at them, be it Fox News or MSNBC or CNN or, you know, people understand that the, that the consolidated media has interests that they are promoting. And that the great thing, I mean, how Bernie got around it was um, because he got crap for coverage of his campaign in the mainstream media, but he he got um, he built a, mo a movement and a movement of people who are very active on social media and in the alternative media, um, in the non-consolidated independent media, and so I think instead of uh, you know thinking about like we who are activists and who see the urgency of all of the crises we're in. Um, the question that we need to be asking us ourselves is how can we strengthen the independent media and um, strengthen networks of people who have who, who are accessing that. Um, and, you know, pa Paul is a decades long practitioner in independent media, and um, I think he might have some some things to say about that. I guess I can say a few things. It certainly is a consolidation of the media, uh, you know, the corporate media in the United States where, and you give you a good example, uh, uh, all the newspapers in Northern Wisconsin, the five uh, local newspapers are now owned all by the same newspaper chain and uh, Enbridge, a foreign corporation in Canada, uh, spends uh, money in each one of them every week to promote uh, their line three replacement in northern Minnesota to the tune of, of, of thousands of dollars for, for one media company itself. And so we've heard from reporters on the spot locally that their publishers had says, no, we'll pick up the Associated Press story, which is always much more sterile and distant than anything uh, local. So I'm, I'm simply hoping that uh, media, the social media that exists allows the truth to get out. But I'm, I'm, a, little bit, uh, I'm a little bit scared about what's occurred with uh, the disappearance of so much uh, small media organizations. But in, on the other end, a lot of independent groups of news gatherers and people in the local community having that online presence. So we're going through a heck of an upheaval uh, on that end. And, you know, in, it, it also kind of reflects on where we are with political parties. A lot of people are anticipating that uh, there may be a divide in the Republican Party because of the politics between Trump and the other GOP people. And I think there's people that suspect that uh, the Democratic Party could do the same depending on what, what happens. But <clears throat> I see that, you know, here in the United States, the two party system is just totally uh, being something that's uh, regressive and uh, would 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 absolutely endorse uh, you know proportional uh, voting and uh, multiple parties and the ability of smaller parties to participate. I, I was part of the Winona LaDuke Nader campaign in the year 2000. Uh, we took you know 20 million votes uh, 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 from somewhere and uh, people blame me and Winona LaDuke for George Bush winning in that case. And that was a proud moment in my life because I thought the next candidates ought to be calling me to ask for my endorsement <laughs> in that case, but they didn't. Uh, but, it, but it was a difficult situation to be in uh, between um, you know, a, uh, those two candidates uh, knowing that we were still running a campaign on, on principle and ideas uh, but that it was seen as a destructive force within a lot of progressive communities because uh, of the fact of what it what it did. It it perhaps allowed. I just say Al Gore lost his own election, his own state, and uh, th those kinds of things. But at the same time, we both me and Leduc understand the impact of third party politics. And there's people still trying to encourage her to run again, and she said no because she knows that 
probably one of the only ways we can defeat uh, Trump, Trumpism was to form that coalition and hope for the best. I mean, some of these small coalitions of indigenous voters and environmental groups and socialists and other people were the winning factor in his election this times by all means, you know, uh, different groups of people from inner city Milwaukee black voters and, and in Georgia can claim that victory as well because it all took a partnership. Uh, but it's a coalition that's strung together that's very precarious. And uh, I don't see any alternative to the two party political system that's emerged that, that gives me faith, but is absolutely, a, I think a necessity for the future. You know, but that's going to take a lot of reform and a lot of forward thinking, and and I don't see a lot of that discussion. I certainly don't see the infrastructure to head in that direction, except at the local level, where it's easier to get proportional voting and uh, you know voting uh, consensus voting and other efforts that uh, are better expressive of of uh, people's uh, desires and the need to form those coalitions to govern. Absolutely. We um, actually at a local level in Stroud tried to um, request that we use proportional representation at our next uh, local elections. Unfortunately, that was rejected, but hopefully we will try and try again. So um, I'm conscious of the time. I'm going to ask um, Dominic White to ask his question and then uh, maybe we'll get sort of uh, final thoughts from our three speakers and um, before we end. So Dominic, are you there? Can you unmute yourself? I am here, thank you very much. Um, so first of all, a huge thank you for everyone. Um, it's just been amazing listening to, to everyone what, what they've been saying. Um, loads of really intellectual views. I run some eco clubs, I talk to children on a regular basis. What hope can we give them in really simple terms that they can take away at the moment when they're really anxious about what's happening in the world? Can you put in one simple sentence, a statement I can take to them at the Eco Club and say, here's some hope. This is what some intelligent people have told me. Thanks, Dominic. Um, if we want to hands up, who'd like to start there for us? I'm ready to say something. I mean, for me, a lot of my hope comes from the children themselves. So I would say, Look in the mirror, love your friends, um, because some of um, the youth activism, and by youth I mean like I I have I started an after school club with a teacher in our local um, primary school of kids in grades four and five, who um, had some. She invited me in just to talk about local government to them. And they asked really intense questions like, why did the police kill Tony Robinson, a young black man? Uh, how, how, can we, how can you keep us safe? And uh, why are there people living on the streets? And so after that meeting, uh, we, we, we told them, we said, you guys are asking all of the questions that the adults need to answer, that adults need to grapple with. Let's start a, a club. So the next academic year, uh, we started a club where, a, and supported them to um, identify what the pressing issues in their families and their neighborhood was, and then supported them with information and people and resources for them to, to, to understand um, more broadly what was going on, and then um, encouraged them to into activism and to show up at public meetings, et cetera. So I guess, I, I mean, I just think the, um, the intelligence and the, there's a quality about kids, um, you know, I, I don't know, this new generation of kids, like from starting with my two month old granddaughter up until, you know, kids who are about 2021, 20, that they just see the world differently. They, they see the world so differently from us. And they're, they're extremely sensitive. And they have a level of empathy. This is just what I've noticed among, you know, children in, in my community they have a level of empathy that number one, it, it leads them to despair. And so, you know, suicide rates are really high, but it also leads them to deep acts of um, courage and love. Like we saw with the, the youth at Standing Rock who ran from, um, you know, Standing Rock down to Omaha and Nebraska to the Army Corps of Engineers to say, stop this project. Um, and then they ran all the way to Washington, D.C. Um, so I would say um, 
talking to youth and like if you're talking about like kids under six years old that's a different conversation than when you're, you're talking to kids above above that age but I would just say give, give give them space and say what what do you think and and give us our march give us adults our marching orders. I don't know that might sound naive but I've I've just I have felt so much hope from them. Thanks Rebecca. Okay, Larry Oskibus, would you like to oh, Skibus, feel free to come in yeah. Um yeah, I just put a link into the chat. And I want to agree with Rebecca on it. I have a lot of hope because I think our children and grandchildren get it. They are taking up the challenge in a way uh, that is warrior-like and decisive and intellectually potent. Um, I, I I sent a link to a young. 28 year old woman in northern Wisconsin, an indigenous woman, and she was she was she was mad because Wisconsin had a wolf hunt that overtook their quota by 200% when indigenous people wouldn't hunt the wolf at all. And so it was a very depressing uh, situation to hear occur in Wisconsin that the tribes and, and the legal process failed us and our ability to access our voices into the system uh, in a realistic way. But if it wasn't for the water protectors and if it wasn't for hope, we would have an open pit mine in our, North, in our Northern neighborhood. We would have more pipelines. We would have an incinerator. We would have an acid train running through the reservation delivering acid to a, a, a remnant silver mine. We would have oil drilling in Shaquamigan Bay on Lake Superior, and we would have numerous other environmentally damaging uh, dirty industrial projects in our backyard. And while in the past a lot of that has been uh, governed by our elders in a lot of way and guided, I see younger people stepping up on environmental issues and lawsuits and on the front line willing to go to jail because in some case that's the only thing we have left is to put our bodies on the line and stop construction who are there and are leading uh, other uh, are, are, are leading younger people because they can they can see it. it it's it's a it's a different era in which their experience growing up and seeing the disasters of Australia burning and 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 California burning and earthquakes and snow in the Gulf of Mexico this winter and slush on the northern pole they see it so I have a lot of hope because I think our children and grandchildren get it and the battle will go on beyond me. We, we just recently lost one of our most precious elders in northern Wisconsin and yet upon his passing, uh, the number of young people who stood up and says, you know, I'm a leader, I'm going to be a leader, one after another, not just one person or some of them, but they are all going to be leaders. And they says, we'll all take his place if we have to. So that's inspiring. Absolutely. Thank you. So uh, Larry, have you got um, any words of wisdom that you'd like to share with the younger generation yeah. uh, to finish us off on this question? Yeah, I, I have lots of grounds of help. All, all the big issues, it, it's from the UK point of view, maintaining and, in, and improving the NHS. People were out honestly on the streets clapping for the people who were taking care of them. Now it was misused politically and so on, but it's still true. You, any poll that we've ever seen, people know the, about the uh, devastation to the environment. The Green New Deal, which is a, a lovely combination of things, which says, yes, we'll transfer our energy system. We'll do it while making life easier by creating good jobs for people. And we will protect the people who are losing livelihoods in the transition, uh, which, which, which I, so at, at every level, when we talk about the important things, I think the vast majority of people are with us. 
younger people are more aware than they were at any time that I can remember. Perhaps just I'm I'm not talking so much except to my with my grandchildren to young people now I've somehow fallen out of the loop. And I'm and it is a bit worrying because they see the things happening and while they want the good things and know what a lot more than certain anybody I knew did at that at their ages. It frightens them that things have gone are going bad. So it's not all you know good stuff that people that young people understand things. Some of, some of that understanding is very frightening. But I think we have an understanding among a large part of the population of what needs to be done. I think we have clear, fairly clear policies of how we could get there debatable indeed in, in lots of detail and whatever. Uh, we have enormous obstacles in terms of power and money and media. So it's none of it is easy, but I think it's, it's contestable. I think we've won the big battle of ideas. You have a few morons who deny uh, global warming, but not even those are shutting up. Uh, you have some people who, hardly anybody who doesn't understand that we need what we need to do to improve the health service and social care uh, that we can't look after each other and, and when we need it so there is a lot of there are a lot of hopeful things as well as obvious enormous difficulties thanks larry okay thank uh, you oh yeah could I add just I? one quick thing Absolutely. because a comment in chat about larry making him chuckle just reminded me of something i have to say all the time every great political or social movement or revolution takes a good cup of coffee and food to share with your neighbors and friends and lots of humor great tools absolutely um if we can't laugh then we'll cry so absolutely, um, err on the side of laughter. Okay, thank you so much um, to our three speakers for inspiring us all. Um, you know, I think um, that last question from Dominic was really pertinent and that yes, future generations give us hope um, because of their empathy and their, you know, amazing drive for change. But I think that as adults, um, currently with the power to change things, we have to be open to listening all the time. and. And listening to them and, and, and the things that they want and need. Um, so um, I guess bringing it back around to the subject of this um, cloud cafe, you know, it might be the end of Trump for now, but um, the problems that were raised within his presidency are definitely not going away and that it's our jobs to work on a local and national level to um, ease some of those uh, issues that we've got um, both online and offline um, and that hopefully um, we can all sort of do a Bernie Sanders and harness the alternative powers that be um, to make change um, as positively as we can over the next um, Biden administration and um, hopefully as well in the UK. So Thank you so much to all of our uh, visitors who've joined us this evening for a really inspiring talk. We um, appreciate your being here. I don't know if you want to all turn your cameras back on so that we can see all these smiling faces. <laughs> um, hopefully you've enjoyed the session. I can see from the comments um, that you have. Thank you as always to our Cloud Cafe team, uh, Elizabeth, Dagan, um, all of the people working in the background and a special shout out to Lynn. Um, and no doubt Bob, who I'm sure was also dragged into the organization of this session. Um, so we will see you in April. We're going to be doing a Green Party hosting so that you can get to know uh, our candidates for the election in May. And um, we really hope that you like them and vote for them and vote in general and um you know affect more positive change on a local level so uh thanks again to our us friends for joining us we really really appreciate you taking the time okay have a lovely evening everybody